As most of you know that I work at the uh, uh, hospital and uh, I had one patient a couple of weeks ago and I talked to the patient's son. The son said uh, he's an agnostic and, and he also said that his mother is an agnostic, a patient. And uh, she had cancer and she was at a place where they didn't know whether she was going to make it or not. So, on request of the brother of the patient, I went to talk to the, to the patient and asked her if, I, if she wanted me to pray for her. Uh, and she, she thought for a while and then later she said, um, I don't know. And I responded with, that's a valid answer, I don't know. And I started talking about how Paul went to Athens and went up Marseille, and on his way up to Marseille, he noticed um, a, a monument to the unknown God. And so I started talking about the unknown God. And, and the patient's son was, you know, he, his ears, his eyes opened wide, and he started listening really intently. And I told him about uh, Paul's experience on Marseille uh, with the unknown God. And I asked them, I happen to know this unknown God, and I call him Father. Is it all right if I should pray to the unknown God and let him reveal himself to me? And she agreed, so I prayed. And after the prayer, she had this really big, big smile on her face. And not only that, as we were about to pray, um, her son, who was sitting down right next to the window, uh, he jumped up and said, I gotta join this one, this is new. Because <laughs> he wanted to know about this unknown God. So, and I got the opportunity to share with them. Um, I just received this morning a message from the brother. <clears throat> Let me get that for you. And he sent me a message. Uh, he found me on LinkedIn, I didn't give him my email address. But he found me on the professional uh, social network called LinkedIn. And he wrote, so, so blessed by your prayer for my sister. When she was in the hospital about a week and a half ago, she passed away the following Tuesday with Christ in her heart. God bless you with his loving abundance. Sign. That really touched me this morning. I was reading this email and I felt really good about you know, being used by God for that wonderful opportunity to share about God, even in an unknown way, to an agnostic. Um, and you know, sometimes God puts before us um, a way for us to take part in what He is doing. God is always on mission and we're joining Him. Twelve years ago, I was asked to preach, as you, most of you know, I used to uh, church plant and pastor for the Vineyard Christian Fellowship in the Philippines. I was asked to preach at a nearby Vineyard Church in Manila, in Metro Manila. Now, Manila is huge. Um, back then, when I, when I lived there, they said that the population of Manila was 10 million in the daytime. Uh, no. Uh, yeah, at the night, in the night time, uh, 10 million at night and 13 million during the day. And that was a long time ago when we had 18 million people in our country. Now we have more than 100, I think it's about 110 million. So, and, and one of the biggest metropolises in, in the whole world is Manila. With so many people, so many um, squatters. We don't have homeless people, we have squatters. Because the government land is, you know, it's legal to squat in government land. And that's the way that the government provides for uh, the poor. Um, but I was asked to preach. And as I normally would, I would ask God, so God, what do you want me to preach on? I don't know these people. How, what kind of message do you want me to bring to them? I've never seen them. I can ask the pastor, but, you know. And he said, I heard in my mind and in my heart the prompting of the Holy Spirit saying, 
preach on love. Wow, that's a huge topic, you know. It, it, you know, if you were to look for love in the scriptures, you, you know, you'd end up with like a ton of scriptures, a ton of verses, a ton of chapters. And I said, so, okay, I'll preach on love. Well, which particular verse or passage? <clears throat> and I heard in my mind, John 15. What? John 15? From what I remember, John 15 is about bearing fruit, which a lot of evangelists would translate that to mean um, evangelism. And it's also about abiding in Christ, and a lot of evangelical churches would also translate that to mean devotion. And I thought, man, that, I, I don't remember a lot. I need to look up that scripture again. So I did. I went to John 15, read through that a number of times before it finally hit me, really, the main message in that chapter is about love. And that reminded me about the greatest commandment, which is what? Love God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. And the second is like unto it, to love your neighbor as yourself. All right. I've always wondered about loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Now tell me, how do you love God with all your soul? Tell me, how do you love God with all your might, your strength? How do we really love God with all that we are? And how do we love an invisible God? And this chapter talks about loving one another. And I look at the body of Christ in the Philippines at least, because I've been, I founded one of the fellowships in our city, cities, actually the fellowship that is in our uh, pastor's fellowship in our city. Um, we started that off as a small group, and then eventually they, they, we grew, and someone else came in with the administrative uh, talent and skills, so he, organized that into a real uh, bona fide pastor's fellowship organization in the city. Um, how do we love each other? We, I've, I've been part of many pastor's fellowships and, and attended many pastor's um, gatherings and you know, the first thing we ask each other is, how big is your church? Where do you meet? You know, how many services do you have? And it's like, uh, are we here to brag about our ministries or are we here to encourage one another? When, when we started our small group of pastors, we started with like four or five people. We, were, we actually got together because I, I visited every church that I could within my district and invited the pastors to come and gather together. So the, the, the invitation was let's get together, let's encourage one another, let's just love up on each other. And if we're having any problems in our churches, in our ministries, then we're here to, you know, give encouragement and pray for each other. But I find that wherever you go, there's always this, this difficulty in trying to relate with other churches. And I've, I've seen in the internet that the definition of a church or a fault is the church down the road. Did you get that? The definition of hope is a church down the road. You get it, right? So the church down the road in Oki, there's one church there at the corner that they have to place. That would be a cult. Right? But it's not true. That's not true. Okay? The definition of cult is not that, but rather you know, something else. But we tend to look at other churches with suspicion. We tend to look at other denominations with a lot of suspicion. We tend to look at the other, uh, you know, the other parts of the body of Christ with a lot of suspicion because they don't teach, they don't preach what we preach. They don't sing songs like we sing songs. They don't do ministry like we do ministry. Some churches are social gospel. Some churches are holiness. Some churches are you know, evangelicals, we 
consider ourselves evangelicals because we're part of the National Evangelical Association, and so is the Vineyard. The Vineyard is part of the National Evangelical Association here in this country. We are also, uh, the Vineyard in the Philippines was one of the first um, churches in the 80s to become part of the uh, Philippine Council of Evangelical Churches. So, but we always, we always tend to look at other churches with suspicion, other Christians with suspicion. I was the first minister in the Philippines, the Worldwide Church of God, to ever go to a, to a seminary. I, 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 I broke the barrier. Um, and as soon as I stepped in, or I asked, I applied to go to that seminary, the first question was, what's your church? Worldwide Church of God. Do you see your, um, your statement of faith? And tell me about that Armstrong church. So I had to prove to them that, hey, we've changed, you know, and you can trust me, I'm not going to try to convert all these other students into Armstrongists. So I approach John chapter 15 with that mindset. But well, let's look at John 15 this time, in the right way, in the way that the disciples actually went through that particular incident in the scriptures. John chapter 15, verses 1, beginning in verse 1. Now, before we begin in verse 1, let's start with this. Um, go back a couple of slides. Yeah, that one. Now, John chapter 15 happened right after the Last Supper. Now, Jesus and the disciples, as you know, they went up the upper room, they had Passover, and during Passover, Jesus said, I've been waiting for this time, for a long, long time. I wanted to have this supper with you. And at the end of the supper, what did he do? He took up the cup and said, this is the cup of the new covenant. Drink this. This is my blood. And so he took wine gave new meaning to that wine and said, this is the new covenant. This is the blood of the new covenant. Take it, drink it. So soon after they were done with that um, supper, he said, let's go. So they, they went down from the upper room. They went down and according to scholars, they probably uh, were meeting at the southwest end of the city they went down, went outside the walls, walked down some vineyards on the way to the Garden of Gethsemane. If you recall the seven last words or the, the Passion of the Christ, he came from the supper and went down to the Garden of Gethsemane where he was about to pray his priestly prayer. So this was the journey between the Last Supper and his prayer of the garden. Okay? So they were walking through some vineyards. And you know how Jesus is. This is what I like about Jesus. And he walks with his disciples. He talks about things that they see along the road. He's always teaching them. Always giving them a message through what they see. And this is what I like about the Lord. Because if, we talk, if we're talking about spiritual disciplines, my favorite is prayer walking. In the morning, I would, walk, uh, I would get up, you can ask my wife, I would get up, especially when I feel that the Lord was prompting me to go, let's say walk. I would walk out and ask Him, all right, where do you go? And I, I'm training myself to listen to Him every time. And one thing I, I realize is, man, this is really one of the best ways to hear the Lord, one of the best ways for Him to teach you. So I did that this morning. He walks with us and teaches us along the way. Do you remember that uh, message or that passage in Deuteronomy where it says, um, teach your children when you're lying down, when you're sitting up, when you're walking along the way. That's how Jesus walks with us. He teaches us along the way. 
And I heard, I learned so much from him just by walking with him, not just on prayer walks, but sometimes, you know, we would be walking to a, uh, one of our ministries in, uh, among the urban, urban poor, and he would speak to me while we were walking. And I, I learned so much just from walking with him. And it's always in line with the scriptures. Always in line with the scriptures. It's never like some weird idea. I know the difference between my thoughts and the Lord's thoughts from constantly walking with Him every day. And so they were walking down this vineyard, and He says, and they're looking at the vineyards, they're walking along the way, um, just like that. They're walking through the vineyards, and the Lord starts talking. He begins to give an object message. Verse 1, the Lord says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. That's nice. The first question that comes to my mind is, is there a false vine? If there's a true vine, there must be a false vine. But if you look at the, uh, what they're going through, the, the vineyards, next Next slide here. You'll find that every year they prune the vineyards. They prune the vines. And you'll find if you ever worked in a... How many of you know anything about grapevines? You worked in a vineyard before? No. In no? A book. Oh, in a book. Okay. Well, um, I should know this because I used to be with the vineyard. But... There's a stump. Look at that stump right there, right? That pole right there, that brown pole, that's a training pole. Because the vine can either uh, grow on the ground, or you can, you can train it to go up and goes to the fruiting wire, which is the wire that goes from one vine to the next, right? What they do is they look for the strongest king. They call it a king. There are weaker kings that come from the stump, and you need to find which king, if you're the gardener, you need to find which king is the strongest one. And so what he does is he prunes the weaker kings and leaves one or two kings on the stump. And we're talking about now just one king. Right? He prunes all the other kings and leaves the strongest king. And so there is a true king and a false king. Jesus is the one who is the strongest king. That's where all the all the life from the from the branch for the from the vine is going to flow through to the branches. Okay. Now next verse. <clears throat> verse verses two to three. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean, which is the same word as prune. You are already pruned because of the word I have spoken to you. Now, through the word of Christ that He spoke to them already, and they are already pruned. Now, we can approach this with a thought that oh, He prunes off the ones that doesn't belong to them, and then throws them into the fire. If you study uh, how they how to take care of the grapevines. There are two prunings during the year. The first pruning is in spring. The second pruning is after the fall, after the harvest. Okay. Now, at the end of the year, when they, the, the second pruning, the vine or the grapevine goes into dormancy. It becomes dormant through the winter and then begins to come to life again after the winter. Now, we're looking at, we, we are looking at the grapevine right after the winter, when they had already pruned, removed the other kings, and left only one or two. Okay? In the springtime, it begins to grow, like this one. It's a lot of foliage. Too much foliage, actually. And what happens is there's not enough sunlight to go through, there's not enough air. So what the gardener does, he's, he, 
you see folds over the canopy, it removes all the extra foliage, prunes the branches in that king that he feels is not going to bear fruit. Now, the reason he does that, he needs, the vine needs sunlight. The vine needs air. And he needs to prune those other branches that he thinks are not going to grow. And that's because he needs to stimulate the entire cane. He needs to stimulate those branches. Those branches get stimulated so that they bear fruit. Okay? Next verse. Remain in me. In the King James, if you're using the King James, it says abide in me. So the same way the word abide and remain is in NIV. That's the same word. Remain in me as I also remain in you. So he says, look, you are my branches, you remain in me. In the same way that I remain in you. It's always that tango, that dance, that very crisis. There's always that interaction between the branch and the vine. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. Now remember this. The cane that they removed, if you belong to that cane, you're thrown away. He says you have to be, you have to remain with this cane, which is the true vine. Remain in me as I also remain in you. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. True, right? If you're not connected to the vine, right, you're going to be down on the ground. Next thing you know, you're going to be picked up. But you see, the spring pruning is not so drastic as the fall pruning. His purpose was for us to become part of His family, to receive the Holy Spirit, to become part of that divine family. So he kept, he's going to keep his father's commands and remain in his love. So what we're learning here from what he just said is that you keep his commands, we remain in his love. Alright, next verse. Verse 12. My command is this. Now, look at that. That's so simple, isn't it? We keep on reading scriptures and we bring in thoughts are foreign to that particular passage. Command is not talking about the Ten Commandments. He's not talking about the 613 commandments in, in the Old Testament. In this particular passage, he's talking about loving each other as I have loved you. Can you turn to your neighbor and say, love each other as I have loved you. That's the command, right? That's the command. Next slide. Verse 17, which is five verses later. Again, he says, this is my command. As if one, as if one command, one statement of that command is not enough. Again, in verse 17, he says one more time, this is my command. We, we shouldn't think of any other thing, right? Because he says, this is my command. What's the command? What's the command? Love each other. Say that with me. Love each other. One more time. Love each other. Next slide. Here's what we see from this particular passage. <clears throat> if we want to bear fruit, he says, remain in me. If we want to remain in Christ, remain in His love, He says, keep my commands. So going back, He says, if you keep my commands, you will remain in me. If you remain in me, you will bear fruit. So what's the key to bearing fruit? So simple. In algebra, it goes like this. X is equal to Y, and Y is equal to Z. Therefore, x is equal to z. 
for those of, all, of you who are who are math enthusiasts. That's what it means. If you keep the command of loving each other, then we will remain in Christ's love. Then we will bear fruit. Who wants to bear fruit? Who wants to remain in Christ's love? Keep his command. What's his command? What's the next passage? Uh, next slide. Verse 13. Jesus says, Greater love has no man than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. Now he sets the stage. He's saying, Right, this is how I'm loving you. I told you, love one another as I have loved you. How am I going to love you? I'm going to lay down my life for you. You are my friends. And he goes on to say in the next few passages, he says, You are no longer my, my servants, because the servant doesn't know what he what the master is doing. You are my friends because I'm telling you what's going on. You are my friends. And this means so much to me because my name is Hebrew, my name Ruel means friend of God. It's not just me, you are. You are friends of God. Right? He says, you're no longer my servant, you are my friends because I'm telling you my secrets. Every mystery is a mystery to the world, but a secret to his friends. Next uh, slide. So Christ's example that we see when he went to the cross, it was the greatest act of love laying down his life for us. But it was an expression of His love for God, our Father. His example was the greatest act of worship, of laying down His life as a sacrifice for all. There is no other sacrifice in the Bible that the Father accepted for our sins. Christ's sacrifice for us was a sacrifice for our sins. And that is, that is why we can go boldly into the throne of grace because we have been forgiven. Amen? Amen. And the, Christ's example was the key to being fruitful in Christ. Isn't that wonderful? If you want to know how to be fruitful in Christ, look at His sacrifice. Look at the cross. If you want to know how to be fruitful in Christ, follow His commandments. And his command is to love each other. So the question now is, how can we be fruitful? And you know the answer, right? Is it A, love one another? Is it B, lay down your life for each other? Is it C, obey the new commandment? Or is it D, all of the above? What's the answer? All of the above, yes, they, they, it, they, it's all the same. Because the new commandment is to love one another as I have loved you, and laying down your life for each other is another way of saying that. That's the example of Jesus Christ, he laid down his life. Now, we can go home and say, all right, well, good, love one another. You know that's preached in every church? It's preached in every church. And even those Christians that we know who hate Muslims so much, they also preach love one another. They forget to preach love your enemies. So really, Christ showed us an example he gave us the scriptures, he talked to his disciples, set us an example, and he commanded us with a new commandment. He says, love one another. We can go out there and think, love one another, but we need to step out, outside of that boat, when Jesus says, come. As he walks on the water, he says to Peter, come. Right? He says to each one of us, come. I know it's hard, 
but I have given you my Holy Spirit. You need to step out of the boat and walk towards me. You can. Each one of us can love one another in this church. And each one of us can love all our brothers and sisters out there in the other churches, in other congregations, in other denominations, even the ones who don't even know who the Trinity is, we can also love them. Just like Christ loved the Samaritan woman and the Gentiles, we can love them, right? We need to step up. So, to help us do that, we can start here. Like Frank said, we're called to go on mission. Uh, we're called to go, go on mission here first, also. Now, some of us may be called to go on mission out there. Some of us need to go on mission here. Right? So, let's love one another here, and then out there, and then somewhere else. Amen. So we're going to do this, um, we're going to do some triads, but before we go there, let me just say this, oh, I have this one other story I have to tell. Um, I met some girl who has a seven-year-old uh, child, and she just moved from Peru. I met her in one of the offices where I work, and I was asking her, so we were talking and then I asked her, so you're Catholic, right? You're from Peru? And she says, no. So, what's your religion? And she says, I'm Mormon. I said, um, oh, oh, hold on. How did that happen? <laughs> and I was like, man, <laughs> you're from Peru, you grew up Catholic, you were born Catholic, raised Catholic, and now you get here to America and you're Mormon? Where did that happen? Did Utah go to Peru or did Peru go to Utah? <laughs> and she said, no, I became Mormon here in America, but I got here. So she's a new immigrant. And I said, so how did that happen? Well, I was looking for, you know, support. A feeling of being loved. A feeling of being family. <coughs> and I couldn't find it anywhere else. <coughs> I said, well, I'm glad for you that you found family in all moments. And I walked out of that office and I thought to myself, that's where we're lacking. That's exactly where we're lacking. And I, I had this encounter in uh, Friday. <coughs> and this was in preparation for this message. See, God spoke to me and said, you know, there's still what's going on, what's wrong with, with us as evangelicals. We're so much more focused on things other than, other than, love for each other. 